or are you going to measure the plant and, and actually determine what those specific ratios are of those terpenes in the plant and try to add in the terpenes into the concentrate so that they best mimic the plant. Um, also, people, the, what's cut off there is talking about uh, specialized formulation. So some people are just deconstructing all of the biomass into its individual phytochemicals like cannabinoids and terpenes, and they have different piles of, you know, the cannabinoids here and the terpenes here, and they can pluck those as they want, and they can build about products that, 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 um, that they're interested in making. Uh, and, and so, you know, one of the things I wanted to say about just adding, capturing terpenes and adding them back into your product is that... You know, the way that these products are marketed can really, uh, you know, mess with somebody's head and day. And so when you look at, this was a paper published by Ms. Michelle Sexton and co-authors in 2018. And, you know, on, on the, the right here, if we just consider purple sour diesel, for example, these black bars are what uh, the terpenes that were the dominant terpenes in the, the, the plant flower. Uh, and then the, the lighter colored bars are what was actually in the concentrate when they just did a supercritical carbon dioxide extraction on, on the biomass and they added in what they captured. And so you could see that beta uh, alpha pinene here is the dominant terpene in flower, uh, followed by beta caryophyllene. But in the concentrate, however, beta caryophyllene has, has significantly uh, been concentrated to much higher levels. And they started to see a lot of these uh, uh, ter terpene alcohols come out, like uh, fenchel alcohol, bisabolol. You could see that numerically here, too, where if we look at blackberry kush, for example, and you see it's, it's a, in the flower, they measured it to be about 1.9 micrograms per gram. Um, in the concentrate, it was reduced by about six-fold down to 0.3 micrograms per gram. When you look at, uh, let's just take alpha bisabolol, for example, 0.4 micrograms per gram in the flower and about an 11-fold increase in the concentrate. So the big question is, are these products that are named with these, these you know, sort of slick marketing names, like, well, maybe Cherry Kush isn't very slick, but when, when you see that and you see th that on, on the product menu, if you're a patient and you really enjoyed the way Cherry Kush made you feel physiologically, you might want to naturally segue into that concentrate. But in fact, that concentrate may be a completely different chemical profile than what you're, what you're used to in the flower. So I think that's important to know when, you, when, you're, when you're looking to add terpenes back into a product. You know, that, that marketing uh, can, can really be misleading. You know, there, there's, I, I found this calculator online that, that told you all the different combinations you could have from different types of, of, of you know, when you had different starting materials. And so I went conservatively here. Some, some papers in the literature describe 90 cannabinoids in cannabis and over 100 terpenes. I've seen 120 cannabinoids and 200 terpenes. I went with the lowest values here because it doesn't really matter. You, I think it, it serves the, the point here. But when you have all these different combinations of ingredients, so if people are making form, formulated medicines to target a specific problem, a specific medical ailment, you can see this, all, the, all the areas for, for R&D in this industry. And I find that to be one of the most exciting things about this industry is just being able to pluck any two or five phytomolecules out of the plant and say, if I combine these together, what do they do medicinally? A company in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, uh, it's called Alera, uh, and they're doing this. Um, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, there has been this, this push in, in, in some regards to not fall prey to all of the marketing stuff that, that kind of goes on in the cannabis industry. These people, their product is just simply called Dream. So you can understand right off the bat, this is a sleeping product. Um, you know, they've got an eight to one ratio of THC to CBD. These ratios are big in Pennsylvania. You'll often see a lot of ratios reported on products. Um, and, and then they added in three terpenes down here, phytol, neurolidol, and myrcene. So this is a product with a defined purpose. It's targeting, you know, being, allowing somebody to be able to sleep well at night. Uh, if you happen to see Tristan Watkins running around from Lucid Mood, he's here. He'll be speaking uh, tomorrow or Friday. Um, and they've done the same thing where they've deconstructed the plant biomass into its individual molecules, and they've created these different moods. So what mood do you feel if you want to chill, if you want to party, if you want to relax, all of these types of moods. They all, you could go onto their website and you could see all the different molecules that are in there and how they've tried to research which molecules would help them build the products that they wanted. So once you know what you want to make, there's always uh, the biomass selection. Uh, there's a bit of formatting issues here, sorry about that, but nonetheless, uh, it, it's, it, people used to say all the time, you know, when I lived in Colorado, I would hear people say, well, that's got mold on it, throw it on the extraction side. 
And you know, people would say, well, the, the extraction process is gonna blast off all the microorganisms, and that may be the case. But the problem with that is you can also be concentrating down mycotoxins that those mic microorganisms give off. And so this, this has been shown, and, and we, we've seen way too many uh, statements like this, you know, 80% of medical cannabis at a recent uh, Northern California conference tainted with mold and other toxins. This is just two years ago. So we still haven't gotten to the point where we're starting with, with clean material that, that's not you know, subjected to mold and powdery mildew and other types of toxins. I wanted to talk a little bit about terpenes. Uh, you know, people uh, used to think that these were waste products, I, I guess, and you weren't really seeing these added into products as much, but now there's, been a, there's, there's always been a literature out there on terpenes and the medical benefits. Uh, it's just on other botanicals, it's not on cannabis. Uh, so these guys did a study uh, where they surveyed people, about 200 people, and they said, what products do you find to be the most effective for treating anxiety? What products do you find to be the least effective for treating anxiety? And I'm going to discard blueberries, blueberry lamb's bread from the discussion because it's in both lists, so we'll just cancel those out. But that cleans up this nicely, and you see that there's three cushions uh, that, were, that were said to be good for treating anxiety. Then there was a product here called Chocolope, a CBD dominant uh, cultivar, and Tangerine Dream kind of rounding out the top ones for being least effective. So these researchers, naturally they knew now, I, I, I know I want to start with these cultivars and, and determine what the, what the different chemical constituents are therein. And so the way to read this plot, you have your, your center line, your normal, um, as bars move to the left, they were not effective in, in treating anxiety. As bars moved to the right, these molecules were found to be correlated with being effective at treating anxiety. And so what you see, at the, at, these are the cannabinoids up here, hopefully you can see those. Uh, THC was found to be useful for treating anxiety, interestingly, and CBD was strongly found to be uh, not correlated with treating anxiety well. So, you, and I'm not saying that CBD causes anxiety. I am not saying that. Uh, I'm just saying that in this study, this is what these researchers found. They also found some terpenes down here, terphenylene, guaiol. These were common in the chocolope variety that was ranked the worst at, at treating uh, anxiety. And so the take home message here is that when you see these types of things and, and you know that, that, that there's certain terpenes out there that are useful for treating anxiety and other terpenes that may not be useful for treating anxiety, if you're trying to make a product for treating anxiety, you need to know this. And if you're a consumer, like many people are in the cannabis industry, whether you're a professional within the industry or not, uh, if you know that you're subjected to anxiety a lot, then you might want to be able to, if, if, if terpenes are labeled on a product that you're buying like they are in Pennsylvania, then you may be able to shop a little bit more effectively and pick things that are going to be more suitable for you likely running out of time, so I'm going to speed through this. This was a really cool study I heard about when I was, uh, okay. Uh, okay. okay, good, I can slow down. Not uh, lots, but lots of Okay, I'll fair enough. Some of mine. I'll loan you some of mine. So, we're only about 15 minutes behind schedule, so we're right, everything's great, everyone, this is great. great. as far as yeah. I'm concerned. This is great. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, so there was another study that was done by a sensory psychologist named Avery Gilbert. He's, in, he's based out of Colorado. And he basically scoured the internet for what types of odor descriptors. Um, he, somebody also called him a perfumist. So I think he has these, these, these interests in odor. And he found these 48 descriptors online. And he basically, you know, th these were nothing that he created. And there's some weird ones there. There's chestnut. I couldn't really even tell you what a chestnut smells like <laughs> alone, let alone in cannabis. Um, but there's things like pine and lavender, all the sort of standard things you might hear when somebody's describing the odor of, of a cannabis plant. Um, unfortunately, in Pennsylvania, you can't smell the flower. So all of Avery's great study here is completely lost on, on the state of Pennsylvania. But nonetheless, uh, he asked these, these people in, in his study to smell these different cultivars and then report on what they, what they, what they thought they could pull out uh, in, that, in that bouquet from that, from that cultivar. And most, most people were, were between two and seven different descriptors out of that list of 48. Some crazy people down here thought they could pull out 18 different things out of that plant. I really doubt that. You could see that by and large, most people were three to five, okay? The common descriptors that people were saying were things like earthy, herbal, woody, flowery, sweet, citrus, pungent. Those were kind of the, the dominant ones. Um, and so this is just the frequency of the time said, and this is the different odor descriptor. So he took all of their responses, and he was able to, to he used a, a, a fancy statistical technique called hierarchical clustering analysis, and he was able to basically produce two distinct groups from these, 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 these study 
uh, responses and these different cultivars. And so he has group A here, which includes things like OG Kush or Mob Boss, and, and group A is characterized as being earthy, woody, and herbal. And then he has the B group, and that includes things like Jilly Bean or Durban Poison, and those ones were described as being citrus, lemon, sweet, and pungent. And you can see that there's two Durban Poisons and there's two G13s. He did that on purpose to see if, he, if they would show up in the same cluster, and indeed they did. The really important part of this for all of you, if you're gonna be making products, is that just by smelling these products alone, people felt like they could intuitively perceive the potency of that plant. And so all of the citrus uh, cluster was perceived as being higher in potency. The test subjects were also more interested in those, and most importantly, perhaps for, for some, uh, they were also a, they were also more willing to pay up to $3 a gram more for those products that had those specific terpene nuances. And so I think that's another, that's another way that terpenes are, are highly important in, in cannabis extraction. Most importantly, don't be a headline. Uh, you know, this, is, this has happened somewhat frequently, and I think it's, it's kind of on the wane, but that's where ed educational courses such as this, where you can talk with the experts and you can kind of see what to do, what not to do, things to kind of look for, uh, those are the important things. This was a scene from, I believe, Arizona uh, earlier this year, uh, where uh, a cannabis extraction uh, ex facility exploded. Um, and, and again, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of media does, does the industry no good. All right. So up next is Dr. John McKay. All right, that's it for me, you guys. Thank, thanks a lot. You. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Lupoy, Editor-in-Chief, Testing and Terpenes Magazine. And uh, I believe we're going to have copies uh, of the magazine uh, available for distribution to everyone who joins us. And uh, for those of you who are tuning in via live stream, uh, we'll make sure we get you a, a copy of that as well. So. Um, is there anybody who has a real brief one to two minutes of important questions for Jason before he gets, gets to slide away? Anyone? I mean, I have a ton. I was taking notes. Uh, Edward, yeah, Edward has a question. One second. And the second microphone is where? Just one moment. I'm going to make sure, just because we're live streaming, I'm going to make sure I come out with a microphone. Uh, Brian, where's the second mic? Number two? Should be in the, in the drawer. So, Jason, if you could stay here. Okay, here we go. And please hold the microphone right about here so we record well. Thank you. Uh, hi. hi. Do you have any magazine sample? We do. I believe what is it? In the course will, everybody in today's course will be getting a copy of, of the... Oh, you're going to email me? Or... Uh, Everyone here gets a hard copy, and we will have a workbook with many of the details, the overview details, and the important topics for each speaker. So any specific question for Jason on the magazine or his role as editor? Okay, terrific. Thank you, Jason. All right. And so I'd just like to say once again, everybody around the world, if you're joining us for the live stream, we are live. And uh, my name is Emmett Brady. I'm the Chief Experience Officer for the CBD Training Academy. And uh, just remember, the first two hours are, are free to the world. And if you're going to join us for the rest of the course, you have to register on our website. Go to cbdtrainingacademy.com, the extraction page, and find the live stream link, and you're good to go. So um, again, this, this event is very exciting. It's all about where the head and the heart come together about the very special plant called cannabis and all the things we need to understand and grow and, and share. But most importantly, um, we get to talk to some of the smartest people in the world and some of the most passionate inspired. And my next speaker, uh, we are delighted to have him back. He is sometimes referred to as the king of extraction. John McKay is a uh, PhD. He is also uh, a founding member of uh, Newbridge Global Ventures, and we have some visual aids today, so I am totally excited. And just so you know, everybody listening online, we're only about 15, 20 minutes behind our original schedule, so we'll probably make up some time over the coffee break and the lunch break. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, John McKay. This is going to be uh, difficult to be by a mic. So we'll see how that goes as I, as I have something that allows me to, to move around. So I can take this, this puppy off and move around with my mic, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck tracking me. <laughs> so um, 
Currently, I'm a tech chief technical officer at uh, Newbridge Global Ventures, which allows me to bring more technology to different companies for the extraction process. So when we're talking about extraction, it's more of uh, concentration. So when we thought of the name extraction, that's not really um, totally what we're doing, because when you're solventless, you're actually doing a separation. You're not doing an extraction. You're concentrating on both of those. An extraction involves two different solvents, or a solid and a solvent, with one going into another solution. Concentration just means that you're separating things. So what we're going to do during this time is really look at the merging uh, business and science of the cannabis industry. So it's not just the science, because I can certainly geek out for a while in the science, and there's people that would know that I would drone on for hours if possible. And the second one is just looking at what those different types of technology are and how you would make a decision when you're looking through your own business practices. So the changes since 2017 have been fairly uh, significant, I would say even from 2016. And certainly since 2013, when we first joined into this business um, of uh, cannabis and the extraction by supercritical fluid extraction is, is really where I focused on. The other ones were, um, I won't say boring, but uh, more rudimentary. And so CO2 is what we first started with and to bring more technology into that side of the business. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. The other one is just the vast diversity of products. In the early days, there were probably only four or five um, major vendors that were providing equipment for the, for the um, extraction uh, community. Um, since that time, it doesn't take you long to figure out that there's you know, probably 30 or 40 people that are providing equipment for this technology, uh, for this application. And so uh, even on that side, it was, uh, we were doing, people laugh now, we were doing two and a half pounds. That was, that was an enormous amount of material um, of trim. And uh, then we went to 10 liters. I mean, the community, then we were going to five pounds and doing five pounds in 18 to 20 hours. It was very exciting stuff, um, kind of like watching grass grow. And, uh, and then we brought that through um, several different things of bringing it up to uh, 8,700 PSI versus 1,100 PSI. And then we were doing that type of technology in, in 90 minutes. And that's how uh, John Van Antwerp, myself, and Jeff Wright started to move into this business. And then we found out the impact of social media. We never marketed anything. We never advertised. But we couldn't keep them on the shelf. Because when you move from 18 hours down to 90 minutes, people start to, start to talk about it. So then the expansion of that is, but it's also the expansion of customers that are using this type of technology and where you actually place it. So why aren't there enormous amounts of huge scale type of work? So when you look at the hemp industry, I'm the hemp industry, the hop industry, you go to Yakima, Washington, and they have extractors the size of Saturn rockets. Um, for those of the young people who don't know that is, that's the thing that went up, you know, the bottom side that went to the moon and things like that. But it's enormous e extractor. And when you look at that process, there was no one who had that much material. So five and 10 pounds was a lot of material at the time. Um, the cost of the material that we were doing was negligible. People were using the flour, and then they were throwing the leaves away. Well, the leaves had 5% material, so that was enough at the time. So now as you move towards this scale, the second thing that you have to think about on scale is that when we were talking to people and they were growing, they were, they're growing 100 acres of material, and then you start to ask the questions, well, all right, how many varieties do we have? So they would, they'd have 100 acres saying they need a very large vessel. OK, so how many, how many types of variety do you have? 10. Well, then you don't really have 100 acres. You have 10 acres. And how many products are you making from those 10 acres? Three. Well, then you don't, well, I should have done easier math because I was told I have to make it a round number. So that would be five. So they're making five products. And from there, now you really only have two acres at a time that you're really doing things. You need a smaller reactor. You don't need the large reactors. Well, that kind of changed when the hemp bill came into play, because now you're growing hundreds of acres down in Columbia. Um, I'm personally involved with you know, over 500 acres in Bakersfield, over 300 up in Oregon. And, and, and that, that's a lot of acreage. And that's not what you're going to do on a small um, vessel. So when we're looking at that, we also have the different types of of, um, of solvents that are available. So let's think about solvent for just a second. And I have a little, uh, a little demonstration to talk about solvents so that we're all on the same page.
one of the pages is not technology. So let's say that I have, um, I have three cups here, and I'll, I'll bring up a couple of volunteers. So, uh, so I'll bring up a, a very old man, uh, John Vini. Oh, what? No, thank you for doing this, but could you step back, sort of? Yes, yeah, right was, you know, right, 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 right here. I'll see you go. All right, Smiley. Yes, no. Um, so, the, this is the live stream area, so just try and stay in the space. Cool, thank you. Is that good, Brian? Thank you. I'll bring up a very old person, John Van Antwerp, if I could. And then a very young person, Jeff, if you could come up. So, we're going to do a little experiment. We're going to take honey or, or sugar, each, either one before. <laughs> First time I've ever met them. And, and do you like our outfits or what? <laughs> I didn't get the memo on the pants. Yeah, you didn't get the memo on the pants. He'll change for lunch. So if I'm able to do that, and I'm able to say that I just want to use water, well, what can I use for water? Well, number one is I can use uh, this water. Uh, you're not going to want to touch the bottom, because this is hot. Touch the top. Can you pour it yourself? Because that way I don't pay for the insurance and a lot of these lawsuits. So yeah, you are. Yeah, absolutely. How's that feel? Beautiful. Good. John is also going to use water. But John's using a different form of water. Here we go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to dissolve sugar in it. We're going to dissolve honey, which is be the same thing that you would be doing trying to get your uh, cannabinoids. So do we have any guesses as far as which one is going to dissolve first? Well, we'll do John's first. Let's see how that's working. Oh, I need to squeeze. Is that going right into the solution there, John? Uh, not quite. Not quite. So they're both solvents. Right? And they both dissolved. Everything that you do with extraction is based on dissolution. You're, everything you do is solubility. There's going to be a certain amount of solubility of this compound and a certain amount of solubility in that one. And it's still not dissolved. So if I was to pour the water out of that one and I was to pour the water out of this one, which one, have, which one would have the greater percentage of, of honey? Everything is very calm. Oh, who answered it quickly? Ah, a chip. You, you also were pretty close, so chip on this side. So, so now you have a bet. I have no idea if you're going to win, but it's a dollar chip. So if you go back through, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly what you're doing with, with the extraction. Whether this is ethanol or this is CO2, they're going to have a different dissolution. So that's why you're going to get a different percentage. So when you're making a choice as a business, am I getting going to get everything out fast or am I going to get everything out slow? This one, however, if he's trying to separate that afterwards, he might want to have it in that mode. Thank you, guys. Very nicely done. Round of applause. Round of applause. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> a round of applause. So this is another example. Cold brew, I saw this in the back. So I don't know whose lips were on it, so I'll touch the bottom. And I don't know whose fingers were on it, so now what do I actually touch? That's a problem. So if I go back through and I look at this, this is cold brew coffee. Who buys cold brew coffee? Well, don't raise your hand on who, who bought this one. All right, raise your hand, who bought this? Cold brew coffee is this. No one's admitting. It's, you know, it's a hidden one. So why do buy people buy cold brew coffee? There's another chip in my pocket. They like the, they like the it's, it's colder and, and it's smoother. There's not as much bitter. Why isn't there as much bitter? Because in hot coffee, you're using a solvent that's hot water. It brings out all the acids. It brings out everything. When you're using cold brew coffee, it's a much, much longer process. And it's a longer process because you're taking out the flavors, but you're not taking out the bitters. That's the same thing you're doing with, with hemp. You're taking out either the terpenes early on, or you're moving through and, and just wanting everything out at the same time. So that's, that's why you have two different types of coffee and why you have two different pricing. The other part that you have on the, on the cold brew is, um, is the speed, right? So one takes a lot longer. It takes longer the same way that if you do CO2 at, at 1100 PSI, which is fairly low, you're going to, it's going to take a long time. But you're only going to get out a selected number of things. If you use CO2, as we did in the, in the old days, and we go 65 degrees C and we 8700 PSI, we're equal to ethanol, eleutropic. We're equal to the same strength as ethanol. So when you're making your choices, it's also the choice in what you have to do for an extraction. I guess he'll just uh, call me back later or else he'll do something on Twitter. So if I'm looking at this type of thing, it's, it's, it's a sophistication of what you have for SOPs. It's what you're writing for a process to be able to move yourself forward with a, with a, with a, um, 
for the business. So there's three ways to make money. You can increase revenue, you can decrease cost, or you can optimize utilization. That's it. Well, you can steal stuff, but I think that that's increasing revenue and optimizing utilization. So what you want to do is each one of these factors, we're going to look at a little more detail and how it competes with everything. So you need to know what your business model is. There's, there's so many segments in the market. Choose a segment that you're really good at, outsource the other ones. So everything starts, as, as Jason was talking about, it starts with the final product. In the early days, everything started towards the beginning. It talked about active ingredients. It talked about contaminants, pesticides, a whole bunch of other things that would be in there. <laughs> When you looked at the process before, is then they would start to do economics, and they say, well, how much is it going to cost me to get it? How much does it cost me to buy the material? The right way to do it is start off with what you're trying to make and then fit the ingredients. I also put in the middle, so that you can't read them on the H, but that's HR, and I believe that's contaminants. So it's kind of like the Dilbert thing where I made them both red. So what do you have to do for thinking about? What do you have to do for thinking about those costs? This is the right thing to do, is figure out your batch type, how, much, how many hours per batch, your kilograms per plant. You want to talk about your cost per day. You want to talk about the capability of what happens for the solvent. What kind of solvent? What kind of electricity are you using? How much electricity are you using? If you're using ethanol, then you're heating up a lot of things, but you're also cooling a lot of things. So you're using heat on, you're using energy on both sides. Then from there, moving through what the cost of the humans are, everything else that you have, your facility, take them all into account. A lot of people don't do that when they first look at this entire business. The other thing that they're typically not looking at is they're also not looking at what I have to do for the actual recovery of material. Is there something I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> I like your hair. I had the same haircut early on, but then I uh, decided to get a perm, and then it rained. This is what happens. So I'm going to make a quick analogy because I never know how much time I have. I think I have like six or seven hours, right? So if I go back through, I talk about angel food cake, and I also talk about eggs. Let's talk about eggs quick before we do the angel food cake. Okay, I have a, I have a thin lip pan. And I can make scrambled eggs, if I'm careful. I can make fried eggs, unless I'm really an idiot. I can really make fried eggs. And then I can also, I can do an omelet if I'm really careful, right? Am I using the same pan for poached eggs? The quick answer is no, but I have a chip in my pocket in case anyone wants the answer. What's the answer? Can I use that same one? Oh, you're so good to me. Thank you. Oh, you did that with your left hand. Are you left-handed? I am not. Whoa, that was impressive. You crossed <laughs> over the body. <laughs> So if I go back through, I'm not making that same pan. I'm, I'm having to use a different pan. But I can use the poached egg pan that has a large lip and makes scrambled eggs, OK? But it's not, not always the best thing I'm doing. But that's what I have. I have all those capabilities. Angel food cake comes to mind. And I have to still have my microphone. I don't know how I'm actually going to do this. We'll see how clever I am on this one. So I'm making an angel food cake. Who knows how to make an angel food cake from scratch? All right? I actually didn't find Did you? You were almost going to raise your hand. Where, you feel comfortable raising your hand? Well, Do you know how to make one from scratch? Not without directions. Not without directions? <laughs> You're so good to me. So there's directions. So if I go back through, when I look at this, when I make an angel food cake, I have to have the egg whites. No yolk. No shells. And i got to make them really, really fluffy. Then I add other stuff to it, right? I add the sugar, I add the flour. So this makes sense. This is what you're doing for extraction. So to do that, I've got to crack open the egg. And then I have to break it open. Then you take the eggshell and you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Then you have three bowls. So I have to put the bowl, so I put, I put the egg white in that bowl, and I put the yolk into that one, and then, I, and then I, 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 I look at this one and I make sure that there's no shells in there and there's no yolk, and then when I know that that's okay, I put it into the big bowl. And you do that 12 times, okay? That's really, really long. So what happens if I was doing it the other way, where I just take and crack open the egg and put it in the, in the big bowl, crack open the egg, put it in the big bowl, crack open the egg, put it in the big bowl. So now I got 12 eggs in there, and then I just add a bunch of sugar. Well, the amount of sugar. Put in a cup of sugar. Now what do I have to do? So if I'm making an angel food cake, I've got to get out all the yolks. How many people have done that before? Probably very few, because if you did it correctly. So now you've got to get all those yolks and spoop them out. 
right? And you got to get them out. And then you got to get the eggshells out. Has anyone taken the eggshells? Where you got the eggshell with the, with the egg white, and you chase it around, just about, you touch it, and it moves away. Okay? And you do that, but you got to get all the eggshells out because you don't want to make me a cake. I'm going to be 65 years old. You want to make me a special cake? That's my cake. So when I go back through, I have to do that. Now how do I get rid of the sugar? Come on, come on. How do I get rid of the sugar? You got to reduce it. How am I going to, how am I going to get dissolve it and get it out? Pick a solvent. No. Water. <laughs> alcohol would be good, but I don't drink. So I, I appreciate the thought. I decided to have alcohol, angel food, and cake. And so that, that's a good dessert. I might come back in a couple days. And so what happens with that one is I have to have water, but I have to have the right temperature of water like we did the experiment before. I can't have it whole water because I'm going to cook the egg. Those are two different extractions. The first one is CO2. You, it takes a long time, but you can ex, ex, absolutely have the different components out. You can have it at the right temperature so you don't have waxes. You can have it at the right temperature so you don't have chlorophyll. You can have it at the right temperature so you don't have the, the uh, alkaloids. You can have things that you can now separate, extract on one side, and collect on the other side. It's, it's longer. It's longer. You can do ethanol, but if you're trying to do something that, that you need a specific thing, then you've used the wrong solvent, because ethanol is going to bring out everything, and then you're going to spend forever trying to get rid of the ethanol and trying to make something. But ethanol is good for tinctures, it's good for other products, but it depends on what you're trying to make. Start off with your formulation, and then decide how you're going to extract. Start out with whether you're going to make an angel food cake or a yellow cake. Know what you're making. And then from there, on the business side, it actually works out. Colombo. I always like Columbo. How many people actually are old enough to remember watching Columbo? <laughs> yeah, I got, a, I got one more question. I, um, uh, so you said he had a 69 Falcon and opened up the glove compartment up and saw it, but the 69 Falcon there went, went down. You know, so I don't, I, I don't know. So if you go back through, but that's your problem. You've got to figure it out first what you're trying to do and then evaluate the business because it looks really easy, but let's go through the first one. Best. The best thing you want to do for extraction. That's the absolute thing, so best. Botanical integrity. You want to make sure that you don't abuse the plant that you're trying to extract. You want to know what you're trying to get and get what you want and don't add other things in. If it's got pesticides, good luck. It already has bad things in it. But you don't want to add things into it. You don't want to use an ethanol that's already got something else in it. You don't want to use water that has something already in it. You want to make sure everything's clean. You do cleaning in between. So there's enough examples with ethanol. It doesn't matter what it is. Ethanol, CO2, butane, it doesn't matter what it is. If you run a product that has high THC and then your next product has, has no THC in it and you're giving it to a child and there's carryover, you have to make sure you do cleaning. Cleaning validation is important. So you want to make sure that you have the integrity of the plant. The second one is E is for, e for effective concentration with efficacy, efficiency, economics within predefined boundaries. I like alliterations. It's my slide. Lots of E words. But that's efficacy is first. Effective efficacy. And then the safety all the way through because you, you're going to see enough places that don't have safety, that's dirty, that the floor is dirty. You want to have it like a, a real laboratory and a real um, nutraceutical. And then testing with modern technology. Testing, testing, testing all along the way. So going to a cannabis show. Everything looks so organized, doesn't it? How many people have been to a, a cannabis show with a, with a trade show park? Ooh. Too many hands that are down or else you're shy. How many people have never been to a cannabis show? Trade show. A lot of you. Okay. This is what it looks like when you're looking at the map. This is reality. <laughs> and when you go there, you want to mark off what you want to see and why you want to see it. Because the minute you walk in, you say, yeah, I'll figure it out. And you walk in and you're doing one of these. You know, you're just walking around people just going, I wonder what that is. And then you ask the guy, says, well, what's this? Oh, man, this is the best. <laughs> we're, we're the only, and this is the best. You'll never see anything like this. Might as well stop right here. Okay. And you move along, and then you find another guy. What, how's this extraction? Oh, are you kidding me? This is the best. You know, we're the first, and we're the only. So there's a lot of only and first. So for that many, I, I scientifically know that statistically that's not possible, but it's still possible. So what you want to do is you really want to have your war, where's Waldo. You want to make sure that you're prepared and go there, you know which one, how big, how much, how much are you willing to invest, and how much are you willing to invest in time. So this is the number one, increase revenue. Knowing what you have is, is, uh, is 
number one, the market share, but the customer loyalty down on the lower side, that's what you're really driving for, and you're gonna drive through customer loyalty through, the, um, through your product. And so knowing that you have a quality product or you're buying a quality product from someone, I trust everyone in this industry. Uh, so what is this, what's the um, saying? It's um, uh, trust God, but everyone else bring data. <laughs> and do your own data. A COA is wonderful. That way when you do your test, you can see how close their COA was. I, I don't, you, just do your, own, do your own test. COA is wonderful, do your own test, see how it compares. The other one is, is time to market and what you're trying to do. So when you're doing all these different parts of your business to increase revenue, customer loyalty and making the products, knowing what part of the market you're, you're going after is important and who the other competition is. Decrease cost. So <laughs> R&D cost. If you, whatever your R&D cost is on your spreadsheet, just times 10 is a good, is a good number because you're always thinking there's no way I'm just gonna be able to do this and I'll be able to do, you know, I'll, my cost won't be that high and I'll be able to have lots of product and then you find out the first time that your bottle comes out and you, you think you have a bottle that looks like this and, and the first one comes out and it's half full and you're going, oh, that, was, that didn't work. So you might as well just do the times 10 up front and if it's less than that, you know, pay someone a bonus. Labor costs, finding the right labor. And so on our side, what we found early on when we were doing CO2 or ethanol is we, look, we actually found the, the HVAC guys were, were fabulous because they knew about pressure, they knew about things going wrong, and they knew you know, when, when things went hiss, it didn't mean that everyone was dying and to run for the hills, but they, they knew what to do. And they're typically really clever at moving tubing around different places. I mean, if they're having to move tubing around a house somehow, they're gonna figure out how to do it in your place. Um, the operating overhead is mostly inventory, but the rent and property costs, um, typically on the rent side as you're doing a cannabis industry, sometimes your rent might go up a year later. I don't know why that is, it just happens to be a trend. Oh wow, you must be making a lot of money. Turns out your rent is now 1,200, but it's only three feet. Yeah, but it's a lot of, it's good three feet. Not budgeted, there's a lot of things on the not budgeted side. Um, Plants that go bad, rainstorms, tornadoes, anything that happens, California, everything burned down. I mean, that, that typically takes out your crop. Um, the other thing that takes out your crop is that someone down the street is using pesticides that you didn't know of when you bought the land or put the land up for lease to growing the hemp, and it sprays and it floats over. There's no way that there's not pesticides on almost everything because everything else has pesticides, even though you have an organic farm. It, it may be that someone else has it. Also, when you check the land, Make sure you check the land for what it was used before. There's a lot of stuff up in Oregon that has ar arsenic. Back in the old days when they used to use you know, arsenic and stuff. So you wanna test the land, make sure you test everything. Remember that they have a COA, then you do your test. That's where I would see most of the time of decreasing costs actually increases your revenue. Asset utilization. Whew. This one's a big one. Humans. Humans are so critical to your entire process. Finding the right humans, um, nurturing the humans, educating the humans, everything that you can to do for that is, is critical. Knowing, get, get a PhD in, in uh, cannabis, study all the time. So I, every morning, so I, I do the following things as a habit since November of 2013, is I get up and I read for a half hour to, sometimes it's two hours, and I'll read every single morning. And I'm studying cannabis, and I've been doing this for you know six years, and six times even 300 is, oh, I'll still there be no math. What's that, John? 1800, 1800 days. Okay, and then times you know at least an hour a day. So when you do that, it's 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 always studying. There's always something new. There's always read the patents. I love reading patents because some of the good patents on cannabis, their first four pages are absolutely gems for the history of cannabis, all the ways of doing extraction and all the references that go with it. So those are fabulous papers to, uh, to read. And uh, go to Google Scholar, I'm gonna type in cannabis and extraction. Those are good ways to start, absolute excellent ways to start, and then reading from there. And, uh, and, and don't read the whole thing. If, if you see some technical stuff that, that boggles you, just write it on the side and head to the next paragraph. I mean, I, I'm assuming that most of the people have their math right. So I don't read, I don't read all the uh, calculus. Exposure to risks is, is critically important all the way through the process. 
I've seen people spraying and doing other things, but it's also when they're even trimming that using the, 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 the scissors that are used for trimming in the pharmaceutical industry, because even though you don't see the shavings from the CVS scissors, there's shavings coming off. That's why they don't use them in the other places. That's why they use surgical equipment. That's why we don't use CVS scissors on our body most of the time as surgeons. I'm not a surgeon. I didn't go to medical school. I didn't get in. So there's thousands of people alive today because I'm not a medical doctor. And their children. It's just the ages, generations of people that have survived. Fixed assets is a critical. So when you take your fixed assets and then being able to go back through, make sure that you're able to uh, make sure you're keeping good care of them. Make sure everything's clean after every day. It's, it's, it's very important. So that's your business plan focus. On the business side of extraction, those are the things that are most critical. And you have this presentation, so then go back through and put them into your own spreadsheet. The other one that I typically find on the spreadsheet is that we don't um, always, so we'll start off with the following. I've got to, and it's usually, a, usually it's someone who's been growing for a few years and they, and they have really good stuff. I mean, I, I always hear about 15 and 20% material. I had the other day a 5%, 6% material and then when I ground it, it was five. The reason it grounds with five is, what are you making smoothies back there, Adam? So you go back through and what you have is, is when you've ground the material, you had the stock and other things. So always take what you have for the original flower and at least subtract one to one and a half percent. Because then you had the stock, you have the other things, you had the stem, you have all those other things that weren't in that flower when you did it. So that, that's important. So even if you have a flower with a little bit of a stem on, that's you know, what John and I typically find. I grind it down to four to six millimeter. And I make sure I grind it in a uniform format. And then, therefore, I know that it's always going to be about a percent and a half low. I, once I know that, I, I, I use that as my criteria. So each one of those ones for the initial research, product development, quality control, somewhere along the way, what we've done in this industry is we've jumped ahead to just, let's make products. So in a perfect world, this is what happens. You have seed, cultivation, harvest, drying, storage, extraction, formulation, and storage again. And each one of those points test. There's enough great stories out there as far as what people have done for extraction. Doesn't mean whatever type of extraction. Whenever I'm doing an extraction, I start off with what I have from the harvest and then just before I dry it so I know what my percent moisture is. Why is percent moisture matter? Because when they're taking, and ask the lab how they're doing their, 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 um, their COA, how they're doing their potency. Because it's dry weight. You want to know what your dry weight is. So have them dry it, give you the moisture. So if it's 5, 6, 10, 12, whatever it is, know what that percent moisture is because that's part of your number. So if you do 100 milligrams and you say it's, I'm making stuff up, 10% and yet you have 10% moisture, then 10 milligrams of that is water, right? So if you were to take that, it's really 10 out of 90 if you subtract out the water. So you actually have a higher percentage of dry weight but if someone does a dry weight and it's 12% versus a wet weight and it's 10, it could be the same exact product, but you have to know that number. And you also have to know that number before you put it into CO2. We, we typically like between five and 8%, 8% at the most on when I'm doing a CO2. Same thing with ethanol because when I have ethanol and I add ethanol, I've now diluted my ethanol with water. So I, never, I don't have 100% ethanol anymore. So you wanna make sure what that number is. And the second thing is when you do the extraction, you want to know what you put in the extractor and then you want to know what's left. I don't care what I got. I'm always going to get something. I want to know what I have left because that's my productivity. You measure what's left over. So I did have one story along the way early in consulting and so I went back through and I measured what was going in. I watched them all day and I collected what was out and I collected what was left over in nine different quadrants. I wrote an article on this somewhere early probably three years ago. And what happened was, was I found that they started off with about 10%, and on the bottom they had three or four. I, I took three things across the bottom of the, of the uh, vessel, took three across the middle and three across the top, and across the top I had like, you know, 8% on one side and 15% in the middle and, you know, another 4% over here, and then on the top I had eight and nine percent along the way. And then you have to ask yourself, well, I started off with 10, why do I have 15? Because I channeled. So when you have a river, right, then you're not getting the water on the bank. 
the water is not going up the mountain. Once it finds the river, it's going to find path of least resistance. And CO2 or ethanol loves the side. If I, if, I was, if I was an ethanol molecule and I saw the side versus having to go through a crowd, I'm going to go down the side. Path of least resistance. If I'm going to find a river and I'm a molecule, I'm going to stay on that river. I'm not going to jump up on the, on, the, on the bed. So what happens is you have to do another way of doing that. But at the end of the day, I told the people, I said, this is what I have. So I had the extraction artist and I had the investor. And I said, this is what you have left over on percentage basis. And then I put it into milligrams because science geek. So I put it into amount. And then the, the, science, the uh, artist going, well, I don't, see it. I don't see that happening. I mean, I got great stuff out. And I said, you know, you did get great stuff out. And so I said the, the following, because once in a while I might have a little bravado, if you might notice. And so I went back to her and I said, okay, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not, don't, I'm not going to charge you for today. I'm not going to come back tomorrow. Just take all the material that was left over, put it in a black plastic bag, throw it in the back of my rental car, call it a day. And of course the, the artist goes, I don't get it. And the investor goes, Wait a minute, why would you do that? And I showed them the next slide. They were losing over $7,000 per extraction. They were maybe making 14, but they were losing seven because they were throwing it out the back door. So you want to make sure you test what's left over. Test, 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 all the way through this process. Same thing happens with the purification. As you're doing extraction, you're, you're getting clear and clear amounts. So when people talk about full spectrum, there's not a chance you have full spectrum. Unless you go out and you juice the plant, you do not have full spectrum. You have broad spectrum, you have mostly spectrum, but you've, by, by definition, whether extraction or concentration, you've concentrated other parts and left other parts behind, so you don't have it. If you go to, if you go to Whole Foods, chlorophyll is really expensive, right? It's really expensive. So you, you, chlorophyll is, is, a, is a thing, but if you're getting rid of chlorophyll, you don't have that part in there. So these are the trichomes. The top one is the is a sisal captate um, stocked one. Sisal cap, captate stock trichome. That's the sisal one in the middle, and over there is the bulbous. And they're very, you know, it's very tiny. The, the one on the end is very tiny. The one in the, in the middle, I'll, I'll typically find that as early as a three week old plant. So I can tell you what a cannabis plant is, is doing three weeks old, because I have sisal trichomes all along the bottom rim of a, of a leaf. And then, the, and then the stock ones grow later along the way. So when you're doing an extraction, and you're talking about getting 100%, there's no reason to get 100% of everything out of there because these other ones, the C and D, are, are quite small and they don't have as much. You know, the large ones have a lot. So it's kind of like my crab analogy. So you eat the claw of the crab or you eat the claw of the lobster, you don't suck on the legs all day. You can suck on the legs all day, but everyone else is eating the, is, is eating the claws. And so that's what you want to do. 90% is great. I mean, it's a nice, it's a nice number and you're, and you're starting to have diminished returns on the amount of From the time you put solvent in, one millimeter up, it's a different solvent. So why is it a different solvent? Because you've added all the things you've extracted and they've now become part of the family. They're moving along the river. So if you have things in the beginning on a river and you have a, fr that's why you have the, what's it called, the head of the river. What's the, uh, what's the beginning of a river, John? Is it the head? Headwater? Mouth, I'll go with mouth and head water. So I have a mouth head water. And so what happens is that as it's going through, it's, it's getting the silk, it's getting the other things that come through. It's, as you're moving the river down, it's, it's gathering other things that come with it. And that's the same thing that happens. So you always have to take that in, into consideration when you're doing an extraction. What's coming out the backside is not exactly what you had on the front side. And so even when you're doing um, recycle, you're making sure that what you have in the beginning is clean. So that's the same thing whether you're doing a recirculation of, of ethanol through fresh material or you're doing CO2. You're always knowing that you're taking things off one at a time. So no matter whether it's you know, ethanol or whether it's CO2, butane, it doesn't matter what it is, you're actually, as you're moving through that sample, you're adding other friends to it which changes all the solubility. The terpenes are fabulous extractors. Limonene, why do you have limonene in your dishwashing detergent? Why do you have it? in your soap, why do you have it? Because it's great, it washes your hands. So every day you're doing an extraction. You do an extraction every day when you make coffee and you're doing an extraction every day that you shower. You're doing an extraction. It's just that you're keeping the raffinate and you're letting the, the waste go down the drain. But you are doing an extraction, so why, do you, why don't I just hop into a shower and just stand there and let the water do it? <laughs> I got a coin. Wouldn't be hot enough, Wouldn't be hot enough for one. <laughs> 
it takes forever because you have, you have to put the surfactants onto your body. Oh, yeah, I'll give the surfactants. So he's already got two. He ought to pass it over to the person next to him. I think that, you know, Gabrielle deserves a coin. So if I go back through, when I have that, I'm using a surfactant. So when I'm using a cold solvent with CO2, I do the same thing. If I'm using a little bit of ethanol, use a little bit of limonene. The plant already has limonene. Why does it come out so quickly in the beginning? John will go through some of the CO2 details this afternoon, but each one of those part becomes part of the solvent. This is what, this is an, as easy as ABC. I usually have a slide before this that, that tells you not to believe this. So um, this is a fake. All right, I just make it up. But I, I had enough people that I started to go through this, and people started to say, I'd like to, have, I'd like to have an ABC. And I'm just like, no, I'm sorry, it was a joke. It was a joke. You can't really pick out what you want. There are ways to do um, extraction so that you can pick out the individual ones like the, like the uh, angel food cake. So this is what you have. You have with solvent, without solvent. I'm going to talk about some of the without solvents this afternoon, um, uh, whether it's hash or whether it's uh, juicing or whatever it is that's without solvent. And then you have the with solvent. So you have both of those capabilities. John, how much time do I have? Do you know? Oh, huh? Six Looks like I'm unchaperoned. <laughs> <laughs> so if I go back through, when I do a separation, so if I'm doing a separation and I have a little bit of ethanol and I have CO2, or if I'm doing acoustic and I, and I knock the trichomes off so I have more of them there, that's what I would want to do. I'd want to, if I was doing CO2, we did it. So if we do CO2, I would rather take all the keef, shake the heck out of that, and then do the leaves, and then be able to do that. So now I have a little bit of, of both. I have a greater concentration. Instead of sitting at 5%, I'm now sitting at 35%, because I have all the keef in there, right? I have all the, I have all the bulbous heads on there. So now I have a, a, a greater productivity. Think about how you can increase your productivity. So that'd be one way to do it. So I, so I call that a separation, and then, a, and then I have the solvent, so I call that a, a, a separation. <laughs> just, just let it digest. <laughs> just let it di and I copyrighted it. You know, for, for, uh, it just seemed like a good idea at the time, and it was $35. So if I went back through, the other thing you have that we'll talk about is we have the hybrids in between. There's a lot of great technology that wasn't available before. Tomorrow we'll talk about, tomorrow, Friday, whenever I have the other talk, about what happens in 2021. So you can have a number of different solvents. You can have a mixture of ethanol. You can have a mixture of ethanol and water, a mixture of ethanol and limonene. You can have different components in there to allow you to have something that's grass, generally acceptable as, as safe. So you can have um, ethyl acetate, you can actually, because that's grass. It's used in the food industry, but you, you're wanting to make what make business sense you have. And these are all the factors that you need to figure out. So even though people say, so I go through a lot of processes before and I, a lot of people deciding, should they in-house do stuff? Should they do their own extraction, be vertical? Or should they in, uh, hire someone on the outside to do the toll processing to their specifications? If you don't have someone that understands thermodynamics or mass transfer or mass balancing, it's a good idea to, to outsource in the beginning or find someone that can, can come inside and do the, do the work for yourself. I mean, so many corporations don't do their own food anymore. They do Cisco or they do something else out there because they know that they're not great at cooking, but the employees need to eat. And so it's something to consider. So as you're doing the balance, how, how much expertise do you have? How much do you want to have? Or how much can you outsource in the beginning to keep yourself viable? Because these are all the things that need to be checked off. And John will go through a lot of these this afternoon. But these all have to be checked off. What's the, what's the size of your extractor? I've got a 10 liter extractor. That's one thing, but what's the actual size? What's, what's the inside look like? Is it concave? Is it convex? Do you have other disruptors inside? Do you have the ability of doing um, uh, um, when I'm, all right, what's the word I'm looking for, John, bet between uh, uh, static. There, I got it all by myself. And so um, I have static. So static means I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to soak. I'm going to soak it in the beginning. Let it soak like a cup of tea. Don't push it through like a cup of coffee. Let it soak. Get rid of all the, all the channeling. Do you have that capability? Is there a way for you to make sure that you know what, what you asked it to do and know what it did? You, I asked it to go at uh, 7 liters of liquid CO2 at 0.86 density, and I want it to go at a flow rate for you know, a 5 liters per minute. 
and that's what you asked it to do at a temperature of, I'm going to make up 56 degrees. Did it do it? You need to have the feedback so that when it comes back to say, did I actually extract? Did something change last night that I don't know about? And there's enough amusing stories that we have of, of, of things that happen with people, the, um, the owners of the building shut down the AC at night. Well, when you shut down the AC at night, everything, it turns out that the building heats up, which changes your reaction, your extraction rather dramatically. All these things are important. And the other part is, is monitoring the strains like, like we were talking about before. Each one of these strains had a, God only knows what I just did there. Probably escape, let's see if escape does it or whether we're just all done. All right, back to the bottom side here. Imagine if you will. The top right, the three, three down button, straight ahead. You wanna come up, oh, you see it right here? Yeah. That one? So in seventh grade, I'm not the kid who jumped up and said, I can fix that projector, Mrs. Wilson. <laughs> I usually sat in the back going, this looks like a little bit of time off. And so what I would go back through is this yield by strain. Each strain will be a little different because you'll have different components in there. You'll have different uh, terpenes in there. And that does affect your extraction, knowing what your, what your flow rate is. So these are different graphs that have been done by Mark June Wells back in 2015, the presentation he gave. But it goes back through, you see the top one? Well, you're talking about what's my mass transfer, what's my mass yield based on my pressure, based on my flow rate, what's my optimal flow rate? Going really, really fast is not always great. I've got a school bus. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm going rogue. So I've, I've got a school bus and I, I gotta get the kids off. I think the school bus has to go slow enough for the kids to jump off. Nothing good is coming next if you're trying to jump them off. It's even worse if you're trying to get them on the bus. That's, you know, it's really hard to jump on. So you, know, you gotta know what your optimal flow rate. There is an optimal flow rate. You can go too fast and you can waste time going too slow. This is what John will cover this afternoon, I'm assuming. So, yeah. So I won't go over it too much, but I will say in the beginning, when you're doing a separate action, when you grind to six millimeter and I have a certain moisture, I have broken open the trichomes by default. The blade has broken up in the trichomes. There's no trichomes in there doing the you know, jumping up and down. It's like sticking your hand in the Cuisinart. You, you are going to hurt yourself. So what happens is, in the beginning, you don't always have extraction. It's already free. There's no one here to guide me on time, is there, John? No. Wow. I don't know what time you started, so. What time, you, what time did I start? Uh, 43 minutes and 43 seconds. So I have 15 seconds? 15 you have minutes? Uh, 15 minutes or so. 15. Okay. And so we have time for a Q&A as well. Yeah. So if I'm looking at this, what happens on that is I burst open the trichomes. So, another analogy. If you don't like analogies, it's gonna be a really long session. If you're okay with them, then you'll do all right. I got a dog inside the house, and I gotta to get to work. So I kinda of go inside the house, get the dog. Find the dog, bring the dog outside. If the dog is already out in the front yard, it's a lot easier to get the dog. All right, that's very entertaining, John. What does that actually mean? So if I'm an extraction, what happens as a liquid, I have to go inside that bulbous um, cell to get the cannabinoids. I've gotta go inside the cell, solubilize it, and then go back out the cell with my friend. I gotta go get the dog. It takes time to go into the house, get the dog. If the dog's already out and free, then it's just a matter of sweat volume and solubility. I'm free. I can just get the dog and off I go. So every time you have an extraction, that's why it's mechanically dominant in the first part. It goes really, really fast because you're not going inside the house to get the dog. There's still a certain amount of houses in the neighborhood that have to go inside to get the dog. Oh, now I'm really going rogue. So I've got different houses, so sometimes the dog's outside, sometimes the dog's not. But that's what's happening. So in the, in the last part, you have a lot more dominant of people who don't have the dog out in the yard. And that's why it slows down. It becomes solubility do dominant. It becomes dog dominant. You gotta go in and get the dog. So that's why when you're doing different things, you have different parts of when you grind it. That's why it's fast in the beginning. I see so many people go, oh man, this is gonna be an unbelievable extraction because it's going out so fast. I'm just like, it's going to slow down because you gotta go get the dog eventually. And so the middle part there is between the dog and the other one that you're starting to slow down. So then why don't we always have the dog out in the front yard? 
I actually don't know the answer to that, so there's no coin. But if I, no, I do. But if you go back through, the reason you don't is because typically we're just doing grinding. And I'll show you some other ways to do this. When you hear acoustic assisted extraction, the acoustic is the thing that breaks open the trichomes rather than just the mechanical, and bursts open the trichomes, now the dog is outside. I'm gonna say you blew up the house, but that's not exactly what I wanna say, but, it's, but, you, but the dog is outside. You have burst open the house, the dog is available. That's what acoustic does. Force field electric does the same thing. You put electric charge on this thing, it's got enough charge in there, the water goes, whoa, I'm feeling really negative, and so it goes off to the side and you burst it open. How many people have ever put an egg in a microwave? Yes. Did you tell your mom? Did you clean it up by the time you got home? You can't have enough coins. So if I go back through, I, I'm really shocked that you did that. No, I'm not. So if I look back through, it burst, it, it blew up, right? Why did it blow up? Because the pressure was too high on the inside and all those little molecules are going, and off they went. So that's the same thing with microwave assisted. You, you burst open the trichomes at a certain energy and then you're able to release the, the uh, cannabinoids and you're able to speed it up. So this is, um, enhancing SFC, SFE with, with ethanol. Same thing, I'm, I'm making the, the CO2, this is a paper that was done back in uh, 2015 or 26, oh, I guess I should read my own. But I, I put all the different papers up there before. So what happens with ethanol is you can, you can batch the ethanol, not running ethanol constantly, and you can move the extraction down from two hours down to an hour because it depends on what you're trying to get. And on the back side, you have multiple collectors to collect the different components. multi-dimensional. On this side, what we're doing is we're able to say, I want to, if, you, if you're a connoisseur and you want to collect the terpenes, then put a switching valve in with CO2 and you can collect just the terpenes in the first 15 minutes. The terpenes are so volatile. They're, I mean, they're, they're just going to be so quickly out, they're just going to come out in the first sweat volume of what you have for CO2 in a vessel. John will talk about columns and all the other fine stuff. Usually I like to put words in John's mouth so that then he's going, I didn't write that. So if we go back through, you can have a switching valve, be at 700, do um, subcritical, do 700 PSI, do this low temperature, you know, 10 degrees C, and the, and, and the terpenes will come out, then do the switching valve, and then go off and do an extraction. So very quickly, you can choose which terpenes you want. If you're really a connoisseur, then you can take off the monos and the dyes and the, all the other ones. Ultrasound assisted. So this is another paper. So it's not as though I'm just making stuff up. I'm just taking stuff that I read in the literature. I mean, it's not that clever. And this is from the 60s and 70s. So I'm really not the king of extraction by any stretch of the imagination. Actually, Dr. Jerry King um, is actually the king of extraction. So I read most of his patents. I learned from his patents. And so he's uh, from the 60s and 70s and did fabulous work. And so uh, Dr. King is really the king of extraction. So if I go back through using the acoustic, all I'm doing is breaking open the trichomes and doing it by CO2. And then I'm fast. This is a picture of them. So up on the side where you can't see them, especially if you're from the back, because I can barely see them up here, is you can see that the trichomes in the cells are actually burst. Okay, I have other SEMs that I've done through other technologies of um, ultrasound and and other means, and, and, and they really are burst open. So now you have everything available to you. Microwave, same thing. There's lots of microwaves. There's a company up in um, Vancouver. Now I'm gonna forget their name. It'll come to me. They do uh, MAFs or microwave assisted um, extraction. Um, radiant. Radiant does that on a, on a large scale. And so they've been doing that for years with all kinds of products and stuff. So microwave assisted is not new. They're just moving it towards the cannabis industry now that you have a larger amount that you have to do and you need faster times. And you're not doing them in a garage in the middle of Humboldt County. So now you have the ability of, of having all those things available. So three factors to, to consider when you're looking at the business side, and then we'll have some time for questions. Speed, scale, and selectivity. Speed has nothing to do with the extraction. It has to do with the entire process. You're making an angel food cake. 
you're not just cracking open eggs. You're, not, you're making a yellow cake, you're not just cracking open eggs. You, that's part of the process, but you still gotta bake it, you still gotta stick the toothpick in it, you still gotta know when it's done, you still gotta frost it, you still have to put it on a rack. You have different sized bowls for the angel food cake, you have that little round thing that sticks in the middle that you can't get the stuff out of. You know, you have all those things. Those are the things that you have. That's part of your speed. Think of your entire process. Don't think of the extraction. Man, we are really fast. We can extract like 50,000 pounds every millisecond. But, you know, but then you have to do a lot of stuff. Then you gotta do a lot of stuff afterwards. You got four days of workup. But I can extract really fast. Scale, how big are you actually doing? Are you doing a small scale? Are you doing a, um, a um, Oh, what's the thing? Um, you're doing um, like like craft like craft beer. If you're doing craft beer, that's a different one than if you're just doing <laughs> like hash. And so if you're doing a different product, you're, you want to know what that is. So that's part of the scale. Can you scale it? And the third one is selectivity. How selective are you are? Are you are? How selective do you want to be when you're doing that? So CO2 is very selective. I can. I can tell, if I have an orchestra, I can take out the, the, the horn section, I can take out the string section, and ethanol, everyone's heading towards the door. Everyone is heading towards the door, you know? And on the other side, when I, when I actually have on the, oh, I'm just really making this up. So if I have the orchestra and I take out the horn section, when I get to the doors, I can separate the trumpets from the trombones. Those are really easy, because the trombones, they just, and those big, those big things, those Sousa things. I mean, you can separate those out on the back side. So that, that's your selectivity. But you gotta pick two. You don't get three. You gotta pick two. You're either gonna be scale or selective, or you're gonna be speed and your scale, or you, you've gotta pick two. You don't get all three. And then I started looking at the S's because I love S words. Well, I don't love S words, I just like alliterations. These happen to be S words. So I added more of them. This is when I have too much free time. I added I added um, simplicity, safety, and then I added spend with a dollar sign. That's what you have to think about. What is your budget? What's your budget over the next few years? How do you scale on the budget? Do you start off small? Do you start off with someone else doing it and then you learn how? How do you do each one of these? How simple is it to run? How much information do I get back? All those things become part of your extraction business. So now you know about extraction. And now you'll know a little bit about the, the other material. So now you gotta know, what do I do for a business? Where's my business going? And then you gotta find someone to fund it. And if you're not needing anyone to fund it and you have that much money, then I would, I'd just save your money and just do something else. I mean, it seems like you don't have money. But uh, when I'm looking at the medical side, that's what I would look at. I would look at where's the benefit of where the products are going. So in review, increase revenue, decrease cost. Optimize utilization. It comes down to those three parts, and then when you're doing extraction, I would head towards the S's. And where does that bring you? And so that's the same thing, scaling for economy and why it hasn't happened and why it's moving towards now. And it doesn't always win. So the greatest technology doesn't always win. Disruptive technology doesn't mean that that's the next best thing to have. It means it's something for you to consider. So whether it's productivity, controlled extraction, scalability, or whether you're, you're doing a trade-off with traditional, figure out where that balance is for your business, not for what everyone else says in a magazine or anything. And the other one I'd say is, remember, when you have a COA, it doesn't matter. You do your own COA. Double check on everything that you have. And make sure you have all these things taken into consideration. Electricity, available electricity, cost of electricity and then make it into a spreadsheet that you have everything in there on the one side, knowing what you're doing for a, a, a type of balance, and on the end, you're gonna have an ROI. And an ROI is based on the amount of time that your return is, not just the cost. So all these slides are available, so when you wanna look at them in more detail. Thank you very much, and I'm sure there must be, hopefully there's some questions. Okay, we've got a few minutes for some questions. Anyone have a question for John? Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> I don't like the way you're laughing. <laughs> I just have a question. Did, did in, in doing this, did you find that 
one of the extraction uh, precursors was better than the other in terms of like the ultrasound assisted extraction or the microwave? Did you find one was better suited for what we're talking about doing now uh, over another? Is, is there a better one in your opinion? So when I'm looking at the different modes of pre-extraction, so when you're able to scale things, the the ultrasound is easier to scale than the microwave. If you do the microwave incorrectly, then you're going to heat it up and you're going to get degradation products. Ult ultrasound typically isn't going to do that if you're just having a little bit of a solvent go through and, and uh, open up the trichomes. So, I mean, that's, that's the simplest one. Ultrasonic assisted has been out there for a long time. And so there's, there's material out there and, and uh, instruments that you can buy that do that at scale. Ah, uh, yes. Whoops. What type of mill do you like better? <laughs> so I can't, do any, I can't do anything as far as vendors and stuff. So, um, and I use a lot of them. So um, it's um, kind of like what kind of Cuisinart, I was going to say what kind of Cuisinart do I like? Wouldn't that be redundant? I would already say Cuisinart. So the biggest thing is to have one that allows you to have at scale the mill size that's appropriate. So you want to have something that gives you the six millimeter for CO2. I like something bigger for uh, tetrafluoroethane, which is refrigerant. I like to go 10 millimeters for that. I like to be in the same sort of range if I'm in the ethanol. So the ethanol and CO2, I like the same sort of range. That gives me a particle size that's small enough, but it also gives me interstitial space between the particles so I can actually get the material in between there. So part of it's, you don't want to go down to tiny, tiny size and you think, oh, well, if tiny's better. It's not because then you can't get the solvent through. It's like trying to run through a wall versus run through a door. And so uh, as long as you can have something that allows you to have at your scale um, that type of material. So I've, I, I use a number of them. There's, there's a number of them that are out there. And a lot of them, if you go to an exhibition that has, um, look, for, uh, look for milling <laughs> and then go to all those vendors and then and do the thing where you walk back through because they will all be the best, so that will help you. But there's a hammer mill and there's yeah. different types. So I would, so I need something that, so a hammer mill is okay, but I need something that allows me to have the size distribution. So it's usually having something that has a sieve somewhere along the way that has a sieve. I mean, I use my big stuff. I use something, I, when I'm doing acres of stuff, I use a, a muffin monster type of thing. That's in Irvine, California, so. There's a whole story to Muffin Monsters, but it allows me to have something, whether it's wet or dry, and then I can grind up anything. But there's some out of Chicago. Look at any milling. We're not the only people that mill. Yes. Yes. Um, so between uh, solventless extract and uh, solvent extract, do you think, uh, say, like solventless diamonds and isolate, there'd be one would have a better benefit than the other? It goes back to the, to the real formulation. So when I'm looking at solventless, a lot of time with the solventless, I have many more components in there. So whether if I'm doing a keef or if I'm doing something that's smaller, if I'm doing a, a resin, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna have more components in there, but then how do I get them into the, into the human body in a, an appropriate, scalable way so that becomes your formulation? I, I, am, I have no bias on formulation solvent versus solventless. And this afternoon I'll go through about six or seven ways of doing solventless. So maybe uh, then you can take a choice this afternoon and we can look at those. Thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Oh. We have time for one more and then uh, we're gonna take a coffee break. Uh, we can do two more. <clears throat> if we wanna go all the way up to isolate, CBD isolate, yes. and you wanna scale up, what would be the best solvent? <laughs> There, there's, so I'll back up, I'll back up to the formulation and the cost and what's available for where you are, where, where you Colorado. Oh, Colorado. So Colorado allows ethanol and they allow CO2. Um, I, ha I have this preference on just based on what I'm trying to make for my final formulation. So if I'm doing something that has to be really isolated in that respect and I'm trying to minimize the cost of getting me there, then, then I, you know, I'll lean towards the CO2 if I don't have something that allows me to get rid of the ethanol economically. 
So if I'm really, really large at some point in time, then I'm, I'm building Saturn rockets with ethanol. So it depends on the scale. So it's almost like a, a scale thing that if I'm you know, only doing you know, a couple thousand pounds a day, ethanol seems to fight. But if I start to go bigger than that, then it gets really, really large. And, uh, and that's the, the cost of, of doing that. So it, it's based on scale. I have a question. On, on, the, on the larger side, I go CO2. On the smaller side, I go ethanol. And then I'd, I'd find a refinery that allows me to get the ethanol back. But um, I guess talk offline as far as what your size is is probably a good thing, too. I mean, I, I'm using a lot of Deutsch processing work with customers. They do a nice job with ethanol. But there's other people, too. Yes? Last question. Last question from Ohio. What is the biggest mistake that you think a lot of companies are taking on in the processing world at this point in the biggest mistake that I see commonly is the under budgeting for the reality of this industry, as well as, uh, and the under budgeting can come from the under budgeting of time. You have no idea, no. A lot of people don't accurately um, project how long it's going to take to go through all the regulations of the local because they, they do a check mark that says, I've, I've submitted my application to the local government and it should be three days. And three months later, you're going, Let's see, I'm burning through how many thousands of dollars an hour? So the budgeting on that side, I would also say that they don't um, budget for the reality of analytical testing. If you can spend $100,000 on analytical testing and your ROI is minutes, and yet people go, oh, that just seems so expensive, and then I gotta bungee cord one of those PhDs and you gotta listen to them yak on all day. You know, but, if, but it, it's, it's minutes. When you have a problem, and you go downstairs and say, can you solve this? And you solved it in minutes, you just saved yourself $200,000, right? So I would say those are the, those are the two things. Great Thank question. You. So can we have a round of applause for John? Thank you, John. <laughs> we'll be hearing from him again this afternoon. And right now we're gonna take a short, and I mean short, five yeah. minute coffee break. Uh, uh, hold on a second, we have a change of plans. Okay, everyone, thank you for this great morning. Yeah, good stretch here. Make sure you're taking the time throughout the day to stretch it out, stand up and get coffee and, and water. We're gonna take the full 15 minutes because this is the time when everybody who joined this live stream around the world, we like to say, uh, have a nice day, arrivederci. And if you, there's still, it's still time you can register through our website beginning at approximately 15 minutes from now. We'll start the live stream in the afternoon. We're scheduled to go on at 11 a.m for the rest of the day. And our next presenter is Philip Northcutt from Sierra Gold CBD. So uh, we'll probably get started at about 11.10, anybody who's watching the live stream. And if we can start a little sooner, we will. But uh, we'll also be sending the private link out for everybody who's registered via email in just a few minutes. So onwards and upwards, Extraction Business Certification Course 2019. Thank you.